Promiscuity, in my case, results from an inability to recognize that it is not necessary to do all the things that I possibly could do. Such compulsive behavior is not confined to acts that come about as a result of feelings of lust. Hate, greed, envy. All these passions can promote actions of a more or less consequential nature which may result in greater or lesser feelings of remorse. A thoughtless blow with a bottle, a casual theft, a hastily written fraudulent check, the impulsive purchase of a desirable and inexpensive second-hand car, the subsequent disobedience of a traffic signal owing to its faulty brakes, and the resulting fatal injury to a pedestrian crossing the road. Any abandonment of oneself to sudden passionate desires can conventionally be reckoned to end in tears. An acquaintance of mine developed a mania for collecting copies of those posters produced by the police appealing for information in connection with disappearing persons, terrorists, murders and so on. They were, he considered, the only advertisements with any real meaning, apart from possibly those poignant notices that one occasionally sees pinned to trees concerning the loss of much-loved cats. The cats, he suggested, were genuinely felt losses, whereas the persons depicted so enigmatically had probably either wished to disappear, had every reason to plant bombs, or appeared at least to have deserved to be murdered. And so he saw at the time no reason why he should not steal the posters and so deny their effectiveness. One night in a public house, he saw a miniature version of a murder poster he had much admired pinned to the door between the public and saloon bars. As he sat there drinking, he was overcome with the desire to steal it. He finished his drink, and having opened the door on which the poster was displayed, he walked through the doorway at the same time putting his arm round behind the door and tearing off the poster. His action was unfortunately observed by a group of elderly people at a nearby table, and they called to the publican, who apprehended my acquaintance and beat him quite severely before calling the police. He is now on remand under suspicion of the murder, as he had no satisfactory alibi. And so it is with unlucky people who commit impulsive acts. There is, of course, another class of persons who are not lucky simply because they get away with things, but because they somehow have a talent to differentiate between when and when not to trust their desires and act. There are times when I consider myself to be among their number, but invariably this turns out to be an illusion. There seems to be something about my character that cannot sustain success. A certain period of good fortune stimulates the anticipation of further good fortune and results in an inability to perceive potential pitfalls and their inevitable tendency to upset whatever little apple cart one might be pushing along unless one takes considered avoiding action. Instead, there results a paranoia of infallibility in which every doubt is swept away by the overwhelming certainty that whatever one does is for the best. This was, at any rate, the case last December the 11th. I had managed, in a fairly short time after being discharged from Wormwood Scrubs Prison, where I'd served a sentence of three months for insurance fraud, to work myself into the position of manager of the second-hand department of a garage on the North Circular Road, which, though small, held an agency for one of the more successful makes of Japanese car. The salary was not high, but with commission on sales, I found myself quite comfortably off and able to indulge some of the expensive tastes to which I had often aspired. Unfortunately, as a result of general economic circumstances that are now all too familiar, the second-hand car market went into recession. The company was even obliged to restrict its part exchange arrangements to cars originally purchased from the garage. In the early stages of the decline, I was able to benefit from this restriction and acquired quite a good assortment of elderly but collectible cars, but soon the restricted sales both severely diminished my income and allowed me to spend increasingly lengthy periods drinking at lunchtime. I was still, however, too euphoric to appreciate the seriousness of the situation. I got into debt and once again became a drunkard. 
Eventually, after one particularly excessive lunchtime bout, I was severely reprimanded by my employer, and in order to avoid the humiliation of dismissal, I resigned. It was half past three. I deposited the contents of my desk into my briefcase, helped myself to a handful of MOT forms, and walked out of the building, across the forecourt, across the road, and into an off-license, where I bought three cans of beer with all the money I had on me, for I'd forgotten to go to the bank, and retreated to the privacy of my car. I opened a can and began to feel a little sick, but this sensation soon passed, to be replaced by one of bitterness and resentment, not so much against my former employer as at the general circumstances of the world which had once more conspired against me. I noticed a moderation of the euphoria which had swept me through the previous weeks, and in some ways this constituted a relief, though mostly it was rather a worry, as there was not much to be said for running out of petrol, so to speak, at precisely the point at which one had managed to run into the ditch. On further reflection, however, it seemed only too predictable that events should have taken such a turn, and I began to be a little depressed. I saw a carefree future slipping away, a comfortable flat, a nostalgic car, perhaps one day a devoted lover. All this gave way to a vision of hopeless emptiness, and yet it was strange that such an image of a possible future should be conjured up with such certainty only on the occasion of its denial. It was as if it was only when failure implied the loss of some desired objective that it seemed possible to know what it might have been, or rather that apparent failure had obliged me to invent a lost goal, for security and domestic bliss had never really been my ambition during the previous months when everything had gone so well. I had no real desire for this false idyll, this petty bourgeois Sunday. How clever are the ways in which society impresses its authority on men's minds? No, surely this was not the good life that I seemed in danger of losing. A string of temporary addresses, a number of casual liaisons and a collection of second-hand cars, but above all, the ability to drift. These seemed the major characteristics of the life that I had been leading. In retrospect, it didn't seem quite so good, but it had its good points and they certainly formed no part of the vision of suburban contentment I had for some reason conjured up. No, there were other ways of living one's life. I might be in the ditch, but men do not run out of spirit in quite the same way as cars. There was still a little time to take corrective measures. I opened another can and looked at the cars passing on the North Circular. Who could tell what thoughts were forming in the heads of the drivers of these tin hulks? It was evident that all men do not do the same things in the same way. And there are, after all, only a few short times in one's life that one can really use to advantage. This seemed to be one of them. It was in this frame of mind that my thoughts turned to the large sum of money that I knew my former employer kept in his house. When I regained my composure, I was staring at the edge of the pavement. I had not swooned with fear, not quite at any rate. The car had passed without even slowing down, and the man in it was clearly not who I thought he might be. Slowly the bottom came back to my stomach, my heart returned from my mouth to my chest, and various other physical disarrangements corrected themselves. As my concerns began to be more specific, it was with some relief that the beginnings of the worry that I might, at the height of my panic, have lapsed into incontinence were simultaneously dispelled by the return of the ability to sense that I had not. Oh, how I longed to be on that train, in the safe world which exists only between railway stations and demands only the passive acceptance of the view out of the window. Why was it that existence always implied that one should intervene in the world? Why could one not somehow contrive to remain a spectator of the picturesque bunglings of others without being obliged to commit one's own? Was it merely that one had to breathe and eat to go on living? Then I would surely have held my breath or starved to death rather than acknowledge that it was I who was responsible for the dreadful nature of my plight.
there was a horrible Alsatian behind the fence, barking and growling. It sensed, no doubt, my terror, and with this interruption of my useless but anodyne speculation, I too was obliged to remember it, and I shuddered. I still felt sick, for I was still terrified, and terrified that I might appear terrified not only to the dog, but to anyone else I encountered to such an extent that they became suspicious. But the man who passed seemed to notice nothing untoward, and indeed to my eyes his face appeared as terror-struck as my own. The fear seemed to come in waves. It took me up, paralyzing all sensation of the external and filling my consciousness with dread to such an extent that I became insulated from every other threat and reveled almost pleasurably in the frenzied anguish to which I had been transported. But as soon as I became aware of this transformation, it departed, and I was once more confronted with the awareness of the hopeless position in which I was inextricably located in the world of other men until such visions of guilt summoned the next wave of panic, and I was swept away once again. The whole landscape around me was suffused with guilt, but this was not the usual everyday guilt of history, the implication of some general crime, but my own guilt, written everywhere on the surfaces of things around me, in their incongruous juxtapositions, and buzzing in the spaces between them, like so many clouds of gnats. I tried to banish these fantasies, but they became closer and more oppressive. As I walked on, the atmosphere around me thickened, dragging me back. My feet moved as if in deep mud. Time was slowing down, or more probably, I thought, my own frantic perception of it was speeding up. Whether to long to be transfixed in the relative comfort of the present moment, or to hopelessly wish to be transported a reasonably lengthy time into the future, when things as they tend to, after all, have ironed themselves out. This is the useless dilemma that floods the mind of a man faced with the fear of a potentially unbearable next moment. Useless because this is not how history comes about. It doesn't stop, and it is only as a result of a participation in the collective blundering of men's affairs that the longed-for ironing out takes place. The murderer or the bankrupt cannot resolve his predicament simply by disappearance or concealment attempts at either the suspension of one's own time or its avoidance for a suitable period. For these are only two of a number of options, all of which require sophisticated management if they are to succeed, of the sort that cannot be accomplished asleep. It is only through suicide that one can avoid conscious and active participation in the resolution of whatever messy little state of affairs one has managed to create for oneself. But then, of course, one is in no position to enjoy the opportunity for peace of mind that hopefully results. Suicide might provide a way out, but what was also needed was a way back. Perhaps the detection of my crime would not be the end of everything. It would mean prison, certainly, but prison was not so bad, or it didn't seem so bad in retrospect. Every man, after all, lives in his own prison to a greater or lesser extent, whether he knows it or not. At least in a real prison, one knows where one stands. The life may be restricted, but there are opportunities for study, which I have always found difficult in other surroundings, and the confined circumstances often encourage romance, so difficult to find in the world outside, where so many find strange objects on which to fasten their desire. If prison was the worst thing that could happen, then I was not yet undone completely. But I might still avoid detection, if I was just able to calm myself, to suppress the panic that so exaggerated every pessimistic thought, perhaps I would get away with it. Perhaps I would even manage to keep the money. It was still there inside my shirt. I pretended to myself that I had forgotten all about it until now. But in fact, even terror had never quite banished the thought of it. The one enduring consistency in my life seemed to be the value I placed on wealth. Even as a small boy, I was always intrigued by the air of unassuming confidence that surrounds the children of comfortably wealthy parents, and their enviable ignorance of the guilt that is the necessary corollary of wealth, just as cruelty was the corollary of their beauty. Other values, though, had changed. When a boy, I had thought of killing only as the unpleasant duty of a soldier, or a patriot against an oppressing imperialist. But now, twenty years later, I found myself a murderer. The house that I was trying to run from was not unlike that happy home of my childhood. 
my former employer's wife, who I had been obliged to hit over the head when she discovered me taking the money, was the same age as the mother I had loved as a boy. Now all these earliest memories signified only betrayal. I had been betrayed by them, and now, by my crime, I had betrayed them myself. So it is that men and women fall out of sympathy with the society into which they are born, and which creates them, for the expectations of infancy are rarely fulfilled. The worry of ownership of commodities replaces the simple enjoyment of toys, and the unpleasant facts that underlie the production of both these categories of goods become only too evident. Yes, patriotism is certainly a fragile affair. It seems possible to be a patriot only in countries that are progressive, or where for one reason or another the majority of the population is similarly oppressed by a foreign power or a small ruling class. In most of the Western nations, however, more or less everyone oppresses more or less everyone else to a greater or lesser degree. So the real issues are unclear, and there is certainly no consensus about the actual politics of the bondage everyone feels. In these circumstances, those people who claim to be patriotic can only be cynics, and any who take pride in their nationality merely reveal their own morbid love of decay. I gain some reassurance from this train of thought. If the great men of history could so easily be revealed as neurotic warmongers and incompetents, then surely I could accommodate myself to my own little escapade, and subsequently live with its history, even if I could not forget it. If the values from which I derived my sense of guilt were so corrupt, it should be easy to deny it, and yet I could not shake it off, for those who feel themselves to be outsiders have but one big misconception. They think they are different to everyone else. Of course I could not deny my guilt in this way. I might dislike these values, but I had no others, and even if I could have invented them, I would never have been able to escape the myths that had shaped my entire perception. In any case, my sense of guilt was not a result of what I had done, but of my failure once again to do what I thought I should do. That was the difference between me and the Napoleons of the world, that what I did, what I wanted to do, and what I thought I should do were always worlds apart. But then it hit me, a revelation, though it was perhaps less a revelation than a realization that at last the panic had subsided. The boys who passed noticed my elation. I have never been a believer, but I am bound to say that I felt it as a message from God. I would escape. My disconcerted ambitions were finally united to this end. I knew what I had to do. I was absolved. I gazed transfixed at the view, secure in the knowledge that I would now transcend the iron grip of history. I got away. That night I took a plane to Nice, where I managed to settle down quite quickly in the world of petty crime that one reads about in the papers there. <laughs> 